Morning, Reese. Morning, Dries. Good morning. Anna. Morning. Nice to see you both again. And yourself. And yourself. Likewise, yes. Yeah. So just for a bit of context um, for everyone listening, watching, uh, the three of us were asked to come together uh, to speak and discuss around uh, the question of diversity in the arts, both from an organizational point of view, um, how organizations are tackling this, but also as artists working in the sector. Um, and this is also following on from uh, a discussion we had on Monday, uh, and it's a pre-recorded discussion. And after our chat on Monday, we felt it'd be nice to continue this with a little follow-up, a coda, with anything remaining, and to have that time reflection in between Monday and now. So we're just going to go around do some intros to everyone. Um, Reese, would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. So my name is Reese Amos. I am currently the artistic associate at Birmingham Opera Company. Um, prior to that, I was a freelance um, theatre director, um, singer, songwriter and composer, um, earning my stay really more in the compositional side um, of theatre and film. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about me, really. I think that's quite brief, but it says everything. Dries? So I'm Dries uh, Duibi. Um, I'm currently part of a shared direction um, in Kunstfestival des Arts, which is a festival based in Brussels, a festival which happens every year in May, and it's an international performing arts festival. Um, and before that, so I, in, in, in the constellation and my function within the festival is more of an artistic direction, but I also share the general direction. And we also currently rethinking our uh, mode of organizing our organization. So, so this is also in development and in evolution. And before that, I was a performing arts uh, programmer in Birchaburg, which is a theater also in Brussels. Okay, well, thank you, Joris. Um, so my name is Annie Poiling Lock. Um, I've been working for uh, a while as an independent dance artist. Um, so mainly I work as a choreographer, a performer and a teacher and very recently since April um, I started the role of co-artistic director alongside uh, freelance curator and producer Cat Bridge at the Siobhan Davis Studios in London which is an organisation that supports um, experimental and contemporary dance practices and similar to you Doris, we're in a co-directorship um, and we are in a process of uh, looking at logistics and ways to work. Um, so in view of this discussion and in view of diversity in the arts, there was something that came up in a chat I was having yesterday um, about how a lot of this, th there's the ideology, but then there's also the how this then manifests in logistics and practicalities. And mm. it's in these details that we see where that integrity lies. So I was trying to post up into the chat just uh, the little blurb that was on the website for BFest for advertising this chat, and I've been asked to chair it, but um, I'm I think the chairing is going to be very soft, and it'll just be mainly to help time keep and maybe to push uh, focus in on some questions if if they come up, but. Um, by no means does that mean to be a, a hard hierarchy during this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm as prepared as you two, I think, for this. Brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read out um, what's in the website advertised and, and maybe we can just respond immediately to this with uh, also why we're here um, and how we felt about being asked to be here. So what are the current challenges that artists and the cultural industries are facing around diversity? How are we tackling them and what should our next steps be? Um, so we've been asked to discuss our experiences and share any views we have on tackling racism in the arts. Um, so maybe we could start with 
uh, talking about why you agreed to be part of this discussion and how you felt about being asked to be here. Reese, would you like to begin? Yeah, no problem. Um, I First and foremost, I was honoured to be honest with you. Um, uh, it, I, I get the opportunity to speak at quite a few um, of, of, of these, well, they obviously don't take this format, they're usually face-to-face. -face. Mm. Um, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is that there is actually a, a, a pun, pardon the pun, a culture of not really addressing the issue and having people kind of skirt around things and sort of surface conversations and people get applauded. I don't know, and I, I'm including myself, I get applauded for almost brushing the top of something and making it feel as though something's been hit, that, 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 that we've, we've reached some new ground. And I was saying to a colleague the other day that actually what happens is we start to just um, self-serve um, the surface, really, and it goes around in, a, in a, cyclically, and and you know the, the only people who hear these things are the people who have asked the questions in the first place, and so on and so forth. So actually, for me, it was actually an, an, an honor and a pleasure to be asked to really come in where the the, the topic is the heading of the actual thing itself. Um, um, and I, I, I'm sure you, I don't know whether you guys have heard me speak before or mentioned, uh, seen me speak or whatever, but I'm. Um, I pull no punches when it comes to anything my heart lies in um, and racism in the arts, being an artist and especially being in a field of art um, whereby my culture isn't very well represented. Um, there were, before I become ignorant and just become angry at everybody, the first thing I had to do is, is unpick what that meant, um, unpick whether there were reasons on both sides. And there are, there are valid reasons and invalid reasons on both sides. Um, so often coming into these things, they can be weighted, little left and little right. But what I love about discussion is that we can weigh up the pros and cons of each. Um, and, and one of the biggest things for me was um, to, to be part of the more than a moment movement. Um, one of the first things we had to do was dispel ignorances that we understand what culture means. And, and that's a very, very interesting thing to me. What does culture actually mean and who appropriates what culture is? Who sits on a board and decides that this piece of work is a cultural piece of work? And by doing that, then we can disseminate where these elements of racism and where they're applied and how, where, where they come into it, because often it's systematic, um, sorry, systemic, rather than it being somebody outright just saying, I don't want you to do this because you're X, Y, Z. Um, so understanding what the cultural sector actually is first and foremost and how it became the structure that it is gives us a better understanding of so all these discussions for me are rooted in the gravity of well what does culture mean to us these festivals that we put on um regarding culture we have to have a base understanding or at least an agreement of what culture means to us in order to pick these pieces apart. So that's why I was very honored to be asked to be part of that sort of servicing. Yeah, yeah. And can I ask how long you've been associate artist at Birmingham Opera? Well, just over a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. um, what amount was, of time out of the pandemic? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's been crazy. It's been crazy because of the pandemic, but also one of the, the biggest factors has been um, I'm not coming from a world that understood opera. So what I've had to do is go back into the university of mindset and literally dispel some of the stigma that I had myself about opera. Um, and, and the very basis of it is it's theatre and music together. I can do theatre and I can do music, so we're good. <laughs> that, that's, that's the kind of way I've tried to look at it. And as I've grown and as I've progressed, I've started to realise that opera was actually for the people, by the people. It was originally a popular form of music, a popular form of um, artistry, um, which was cheap to go and watch. And it was watched by not just the aristocrats, it was watched by any and anybody. And actually it was the stories of the day. Um, so what we do at Birmingham Opera Company is try and make those stories relevant um, to this day and give it back to the people. So we're like 80, 90% community-based within all of our performances um, and the protagonists are the professionals, but we integrate them in a way that shapes the story around topical issues of the day. But it may be a story that was written by Richard Wagner some centuries ago. 
um, and just trying to pull out some of the relevancies. And one of the things that has come up in, in the piece, the production that we're working on at the moment is race, actually. Mm-hmm. So it, it, this is a poignant time to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Reese. You're welcome. I just want to hear you talk the whole 16 minutes. <laughs> and then, and <laughs> I actually feel quite strongly that you should be chairing this. this no, session. never, never. Well, let's never. actually see how it goes because I think one, you're Birmingham based. Yeah. You're the founder of one of the founder members of More Than a Moment, which is just so relevant to this discussion. Um, and just how you've articulated everything right now. It just, I just, going to hand it over to you. <laughs> bless you. It's fine, people, but... Bless you, bless you. <laughs> I think really, yeah, well. Thank you so much. Yeah, when I believe in something, I believe in it and, re- you know, and, and I'm, I I, again... I believe, though, and another thing to be really able to articulate it and to communicate and share those things, though, isn't it? I think oh, really... Thank you. Yeah, great. And, um, yeah, it makes me think about... Uh, what it's felt like being in in Birmingham Opera, which, yeah. you know, from the outside for me, that has huge stigmas exactly as you say of being an elitist art form or has become. Oh, absolutely. And that kind of pulling back to um, to what opera originally was intended for. And then obviously being a black artist inside of Birmingham Opera and are you an anomaly? Uh, what yeah. did you come up against? You know, um, it's- it's very interesting that you say that because you know when you get a new job and it's a quite high profile job you're excited to tell all your friends and all your family and so on and so forth and actually there was a part of me that was quite reluctant um if I'm being 100% honest with you there was a part of me that was really reluctant because I thought well my community going to look at me as though I've sold out because opera doesn't speak to them mm-hmm. and so now I'm going to work for the quote unquote man etc cetera, etc cetera. am I just affirmative action am I just in there to get the to get the black vote on side and the Asian community on side, is, is, was that my job? And one of the key things that I had to be very careful of is making sure that I don't believe that first, because then you come into the job with a level of ignorance that already um, nullifies the talent and the reason why you've been asked to come and do the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm being straight and honest with you, there are elements of this not necessarily within Birmingham Apple Company, but within the industry, there are elements of it that I've had to step back and go, oh, yeah. also, this is a real thing now. And I think mm. that's both the, both the gift and the curse because I'm, I'm privileged to be on the inside now where there are, now I'm in your face. So now I'm challenging, I'm having to, you're almost forcibly having to give me mm. exactly what you think and feel because I am not... Um, And I mean this with the greatest of respect. I haven't been taken on administratively. I haven't been taken on to do any of the support work. I'm the associate artist. So actually some of the decision-making lies with me. Some of the community, well, most of the community aspect of the work lies with me. So I, what I tend to do is throw the question back at them. Why me? What is it that you want me to do within this sector? Mm. And it's quite interesting to sit and listen to people really try and articulate what they're trying to say um, without saying black or without saying, but I get that the the most verve I get is from the conversations when people have been honest and said, Reese, we can't engage black people. Mm. What's the issue? And I'm like, okay, I can tell you the issue. I would prefer you to be upfront with me than tangential. And the reason being is because systemic, as we know, systemic racism can come across quite tangentially to the point where it can be missed. And only retrospectively then do you feel it, mm. if that makes sense. Okay. So there's, t- there's things that I can think about and go, God, that was actually a situation there. But I pacified it and nullified it in the moment as I went through. And so having the conversations where I, I pose it back to you and put the ball back in your court, so to speak, what is the job that you want me to do? Because these are the skill sets that you've hired me for. So would I be able to do that job in a white community? Would I be able to do that in a South Asian community as well as an East Asian community? Not just within the black community because what you then have to understand, and again, it goes back to that culture unpicking, is the black community isn't one community, which is a big stigma that people have. So I may be able to 
galvanize the Caribbean community, but adapt, have to adapt my language to the African community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you see what I mean so if the ignorance is that Reese can deal with the black community we already have a problem because it means you don't realize that there are communities within those communities mm -hmm. god I can't say the word community again can I surely not <laughs> but do you see what I mean yeah. and, and, and so actually being being inward facing and still being trusted I think the biggest thing for me is maintaining the trust with my community um, that was the hardest part to mm. taper because positionally this this is good for me and my family mm. but actually is that a big enough sacrifice to not be trusted by your own mm. in a world where arts is the way we express ourselves mm. it's just something to think, think about isn't it yeah I am I, um, yeah I can I can really it really resonates what you're saying Reese, because um, I'm one of very few leaders of colour in the arts and very much so in dance as well. And, mm. um, and yeah, and having been an independent artist, you know, literally like hand to mouth, what's the next project? What's the next job? You know, um, and then suddenly I'm, I'm on the inside, as you say. Yeah. And um, difference being that there is a lot of administration, there is a lot of uh, organizational stuff that I'm taking part in. Um, uh, and there's a big questions around the amount of artists that are actually in the organization I'm in. Yeah. Not only uh, non-white people, but there's no uh, people with disability in the organization at the moment, you know? Um, so it's been a very white and ableist, um, uh, cisgendered majority organization continues to be um, so coming in I had loads of questions of oh my god how is this actually going to work and are the things that you've chosen me for are you am I really going to be able to do them or is this just getting you know I've got the ticket and yeah. I have I'm the one that has to now decide and hold everything you know yeah and really quickly we come up against a lot of um yeah a lot of issues and questions around how i can be supported to make this certain decisions around um uh and I'm not around everything because i think we're proposing a very different way of working but yeah. not in this big kind of like uh so big structural shifts but also lots of micro shifts and micro actions tiny tiny things i've been describing the work that cat and i have been trying to do like ants like we're just kind of trying to burrow deep and wide and trying to distribute ourselves to get to know as much about the organization as possible yeah. so that then we so that ignorance again and that information to hopefully act responsibly for a larger group of people yeah. um, as opposed to make surface changes um but aside from that, yeah, there is this kind of how does the, it looks great on paper to have uh, someone non-white in the leadership position, but what does it actually take to support yeah. that person being in post? Yeah, and so I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of whitewashing. Uh, also being Chinese, you know, this, we're often rendered quite invisible. Yeah. You know, um, and I was born here, my accent, you know, all these things, you know, there's a lot of uh, forgetting, you know, and the kind of white washing over of mm -hmm. um, ethnicity and culture. Yeah. So I'm kind of experiencing that on both sides. So from other artists of colour, but also from uh, uh, people within the organisation at various levels of uh, staffing and trustee level, you know, it's like, um yeah so i feel like i'm really in the thick of that i haven't been in post as long as you or drias in mm. his respective roles not in this post as artistic yeah. director anyway so i feel like i'm still in that kind of like I've just open the door kind of yeah. place you know and it's it's so, it's so interesting you're saying that because 
no matter how long I've been in it, I still feel in, the, in exactly the same position. Absolutely. And you it's in, tense at one point. I thought, oh, but hang on, it's surely still going on. You yeah, know. Oh, a thousand percent. I think I'm just in a fortunate position to, well, I keep talking about being fortunate position actually. And again, that's that can almost feed back into itself, its own issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to say that you, you use an example of ants mm. going sort of far and wide, but actually another attribute of an ant is carrying 10 times its own body weight. Yeah. <laughs> right and in, in our positions that's exactly what it is mm. I am actually carrying my community on my back mm. in representing the community not only just representing the black community the upper world mm. but representing the upper community to the black world now that's scary that's yeah. scary so one of the things that I've had to learn to do and this may sound absolutely ridiculous but is just be unap- unapologetically who I am mm. Yes, I'm able to articulate myself in certain environments and yes, I know how to speak and, 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 and you know, sort of, uh, for want of a better word, be all things to all men. Mm. But the, the, the way in which I do that shouldn't be a change of person or a directive of narrative. I should still be able to, so this is me. So my friends in my community shouldn't be surprised to hear me speak like this. They will just know, oh, he's probably using his telephone voice, but it's not a different characteristic. And... What's very, very interesting is um, when we go into rehearsal room and we do have some um, black artists, that um, the singers and so on and so forth, um, and the actors, when, when I do go into rehearsal room and they'll go, so what do you do then? I'm like, oh, I'm the artistic associate. Really? And, and that's my own people, mm. right? Yeah. And then they get comfortable and then they start dropping the lingo and the patwa comes in and... But, but then but that's very secretive so that will be on a toilet break somebody will walk past and say something or that will be you know um we're standing next to somebody and the instructions are being given out and then somebody will say something and we'll nod and we'll joke and even then to me that still feels like we're having to pocket who we are because you still don't feel comfortable enough to be that way outwardly fully front facing so it's very very interesting and, and it's true lockdown has been a complete leveler for everybody and what that leveling does is also exposes things you know the cream really does rise to the surface and you start to see where the mock sits and where the Mm -hmm. so the fact that we haven't been able to be yeah we haven't been able to be as active as we'd like to be Mm -hmm. organizationally now what that's done is put us all on an even playing field Mm -hmm. so because it has been pulling administratively and you know making sure we're fulfilling quotas and databasing and spreadsheeting and so on and so forth without actually the performative side of it now you can't have me for my quote-unquote creative talent I now need to see what happens at a systemic basis what does the organization represent now and this is what's being exposed um and not just my organization the organizations across the board when we're having cross-organizational conversation it, oh, oh, so are you the guy I spoke to on the phone? Mm. Yeah, yep, yeah, it's me. Okay, so what, what's your actual role? To be honest with you, there's four of us in the office. It shouldn't make a difference what my role is, um, unless you're specifically phoning to speak to somebody, right? But generally speaking, what that kind of vibe brings is, what, why am I speaking to you exactly? Or, or what, what can you bring? And actually, you're phoning me, so my question should be, who are you? right so balancing that has been very very difficult and feeling like you're the only one that can understand what the what the between the lines language of that is um and then not having anyone to kind of turn around and go did you clock that yeah I clocked that yeah I understood did you see what was happening okay cool as a sounding board has been a very difficult challenge to navigate you say that because um yeah I've literally felt that like oh where do I go with that you know there's so many moments of just kind of concluding that not even concluding but following that on with saying that to someone or and um yeah not having anywhere to go with that yeah there was an issue that arose recently with a with a young artist collective um that's associated with the organization they've been this kind of self-organizing spin-off from uh, a course that was run and uh, quite a few of the young artists of colour were talking about um, uh, being who they are within the industry 
and it was one of the first times since coming into post that I actually felt like there was some kind of oh you know we can talk about this without having to explain it even we can just yeah. share some things yeah. um but because of capacity it's been really hard to then continue another conversation even though we're kind of on the route to do that but so there's all these kind of exactly this system and structures that also uh shift priorities all the time with from the human relating yeah. back to the administration back to these do. Um, really time consuming things so even the way that emails or scheduling something or meetings that whole structure isn't necessarily how i want to work or i yeah. think serves the majority of people that aren't with or you know situated inside an organization or yeah. institution so kind of trying to break that and soften some of those and yeah. play with that because, you know, why can't I get this conversation with these young artists that I really want to talk to and that I think mm. there'll be a really important mutual supportive kind of thing going on there. Absolutely. Because I've got a million other emails and a million of meetings, all these other organisational structural things to kind of um, deal with, you know, so that that's really interesting how it's coming from everywhere and it's not always in the form of actual people. Yeah, that's you know, right. These um, aggressions can be more in the form of not a blow in the face, but, you know, like a, just a slight tugging, you know. Absolutely. Um, and slight kind of slight obstacles, you know, and I think I think about town planning a lot like that. I think about a lot of kind of interior design, a lot of um, yeah. architecture like that. That so <sighs> being a dancer and a mover, I I think about how much doesn't serve kind of a range of expression in the body, or uh, it doesn't. You know, often we're right. vertical, we're upright, we're right. still, we're walking down corridors, we're in linear kind of. Uh, you know, so I think there's a lot around that. I I, I feel like I can't talk about racism without. Uh, hugely acknowledged patriarchy and of course yeah and, you know of course. they they are what perpetuate all of these inequities and you know um absolutely and sits hugely within that but the bigger shit that's going on for me is is these massive things that allow that to happen you know so yeah um, i think it's, it's interesting about the microscope of it um you talked about movement and so on and so forth yeah. Um, in our culture, we're expressive when we speak, and that can be seen as aggressive. Mm. But I've also, I, I always use this as an example. And again, it's that thing about, are we talking about race? Are we talking about color? Are we talking about culture? Are we talking about creed? Because they all seem to fall under the, the oh, you, that mm. this, your people, i.e. this community or your culture. And some of the things aren't cultural. Some of the things are cultural, but some of the things aren't cultural. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very demographic. Some of them are very social. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my Italian friends speak more expressively than I do, but that's not, that's just something that is received as, we know Italians behave that way. Mm -hmm. It's non-threatening. Mm -hmm. But when I get to this point now, being, a th and, and, and forgetting, forgetting, I'm a thespian, mm. so I, I'm, I'm expressive in my thought and my feelings, and it, things come out and <laughs> right. I'm I'm performative in most aspects of my life, and so you know, just a little slight change in tone or my hands raise it. I, it's mm. okay. Well, if we just bring things back, that bring things back down. I, I wasn't I wasn't up, but I, I didn't realize I was anymore. And so there's little things, as you said, the little toggings. It's just little pullings. And yes, you are right, hundred percent. If, for instance, there's a meeting set up. And so I'm required, Reese. I need you to go and speak to, um, let's say, um, whoever runs the Legacy Centre of Excellence, which is now the new Black Community Hub, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, and try and be back in an hour. And I have to now say to whoever's asked me to do that, um, with all due respect, an hour's not going to be long enough because it's going to take me an hour just to mm -hmm. broach the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And so that also is a, having to understand a little bit of culture. And I know that doesn't mean to say, right, give me the day to go and do it. I do understand there are time restraints and stuff. But again, the system isn't built for the natural conversation to happen. Mm -hmm. Because what you're also remembering is that you're, you're quote unquote, feeding me into the lion's den. 
do you see what I mean? And so the first bit of that conversation is like, this seems a bit funny to me, Reese. Why are you talking to me about opera or why are you talking to me about? And I've now got to work, which they, which some people see as, you know, it's natural. Oh, you, you can just go and hold a conversation. No, I'm able to speak, but what I'm having to think about 10 seconds ahead of what is actually being said and then trying to preempt what the response is going to be so that I attack the next. Having to think like that is not, is, 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 you have the privilege of not having to think like that, basically. In the organisation, you you have the privilege of being completely cutthroat and completely, and just not having to think that far ahead to have basic communication. And I think that sometimes has really thrown me. Um, so then when I come back and the results aren't like, so, so what happened in the, why, why weren't you able to? I'm like, because it took us half an hour to get past the fact that I was there, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's one thing having somebody in post who represents the diversity and ethnic quotas that you're trying to fulfill, mm -hmm. but the people who put you there have an obligation to understand the community they're trying to reach and not just put that on the fact that, so for instance, I'll give you a perfect example, Annie. Um, I was running a workshop with the, um, with the Chinese Community Centre here mm -hmm. in Birmingham. And I, I remember saying to some of the powers that be and stuff, what, why, why am I running that session? Is, is, if, it's part of my, if it's part of what the work I'm meant to be doing, yeah, it's part of the work I'm meant to be doing, that's fine. And I remember just jokingly saying, you do know I don't speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, no, I know you don't, but you love martial arts, don't you? And I just thought, there we go. There we go. And that wasn't necessarily somebody in my organization, mm -hmm. but just as a comment, yeah, but you love martial arts. Okay, what's the chances that 90% of the people I'm going to go and speak to in this meeting don't like my martial arts? Is, is it just because all of a sudden now you've heard, you've heard Chinese in one sentence and now you're saying, oh, I'm associating that with martial arts and the commonality between you and the Chinese is martial arts. I'm running an opera session. What the heck has martial arts got to do with anything? Do you see what I mean? And it's those little things that actually, it wasn't until after the session when I kicked back and I went, Bloody hell. What, what was that? Yeah, it's a lot to keep up with, isn't it? In that way. And absolutely. How much you miss. There's so many balls that are coming all the time, and you're like, I can't catch them all. Yeah. Um, Dries, you've been such a great listening presence. I feel like a, a privileged witness of this conversation, yes. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> oh. It was very nice listening to you. Yeah. A lot of things are resonating here. Yeah. Oh, good. Is there anything you'd like to, any, any, thoughts is that it makes you so many thoughts of course you know uh, um, I mean as in uh, I also more and more uh, are uh, I'm part of, of, of these conversations also publicly and as an as a in, big uh, institution in, in Belgium I always try to be as uh, humble as possible and not to put ourselves in front as a as a as a good example of a good practice, but more as in as a big institution taking the responsibility of also being part of these conversations and not always easy and complex conversations publicly and also put dare to put ourselves in a fragile position. Um, having said that, there were so many things that I can connect now to, as in. Um, uh, and you said that we are already longer uh, at the, in, in, in the working for this institution, but for me it still feels like starting yesterday, mm. uh, as in we started not so long before the pandemic, so the most that we did until now was kind of crisis management. Um, even though I'm part of a shared direction uh, of, 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 of people coming from uh, different backgrounds, um, and from the very beginning, also uh, kind of an inclusive policy was 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 as was was key and was also part of our mission. It was not part of the mission before of the festival, but really became now uh, part. Uh, and also really understanding the wide history of uh, a lot and all the arts institutions in, in Europe and in Belgium, and also trying to uh, working on this history. Um, and I think mostly we are more focused on uh, uh, like also on the program and also like we are we're a festival, we don't have any of our own. So we work with uh, different kind of uh, arts, arts organizations and cultural organizations in Brussels. The first thing we did is like uh, 
thinking with who do we work and which kind of organizations are culturally uh, because as you know like just the same as Birmingham I presume Brussels is very rich culturally uh, speaking so but somehow it's only a certain part and certain organizations which are recognized as arts organizations even though it's culturally much more diverse as this so we kind of review to the organizations that we're working with and kind of uh, uh, and also then establish different kind of uh, uh, collaborations with uh, organizations which are based with the Moroccan uh, based community little theater companies to Congolese to different kind of uh, people but also for instance the European community as in uh, I know UK is not part of it anymore but still like in Brussels it's a big kind of almost city in its own and also it's completely disconnected from uh, what's happening in the city and somehow we're trying to reaching out to and also like establishing collaborations uh, literally like uh, co-producing co-realizing co uh, productions uh, and somehow we also like doing this in, in the program but for us uh, one of our main um, objectives when starting an organization is uh, kind of rethinking uh, not only for who we, we make the program but also with who and so also reviewing but also I'm always even I, like I said in the beginning I'm ki kind of humble in these kind of conversations and especially like sp speaking with anglo section uh, um, partners or because I, I have the feeling that there, there is already a much bigger history in, in certain um, aspects uh, so, like I said, we, we, we're not only focusing for who and like uh, who is on stage and uh, where we where to put uh, the project, but also uh, with who. And so a lot of my focus now the last years, even though I'm more busy with artistic direction, but like I said, we are like shared the uh, model of, of, of directorship. So we try to also um, not only stay with our artistic but also try to have influence on different parts of the organization and i'm very much busy with kind of recruiting and like how the mm -hmm. festival and like like uh, how the team's composed and somehow we have a lot of people of color now recently um like since two years part of the organization also in the programmers team but also in different actually in all the departments um and there um i completely recognize what's been said uh, on the level of ants like doing a little bit of different kind of little work um, so like this is kind of these two things that you are working with in the sense that uh, we try to have a holistic approach and try to think not only anti uh, like anti-racist but kind of uh, an anti-discrimination like anti-discrimination in the broad sense like inter intersectional um, approach which was also mentioned uh, uh, before um, where we try to also think in every part and every aspect of organization, who do we exclude and how do we exclude, like in the communication, in uh, like we, we, we adopted uh, uh, inclusive uh, writing, also even in the subtitles, in the emails that we write and everything, we try to think this. Uh, we we have um, so like a little lot of lot of these kind of little actions in, in all the different departments, which mm -hmm. feels more uh, kind of improvised, which feels more like trying to do little changes, which we feel are significant for us. Like for instance, I know in 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 UK, in UK this are already quite common, but we try now to translate also our performances in sign language, have performances for uh, neurodiverse people, like like try the whole spectrum, try to think and also in the work environment, in the work quality, not uh, like thinking how can we make our work environment more neurodiverse uh, possible, but also like on the all the different levels of inclusivity. But on the other hand, and this is like, like uh, this was kind of a trajectory that we did more improvised and now we feel the need after also these years of crisis management and also after having kind of a newly composed uh, team of doing more structural work, uh, having more doing um, on an on, on organization level, how can we have a good uh, uh, like a, policy around formation of anti-racism, uh, formation on how to deal with, other, with each other, how to have new ways of uh, have uh, meetings, have uh, 
uh, how to how to actually rethink our own organization and structure, uh, like the, the 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 positions, the power relationships, the the, the contracts, all these things. So so these like we come from a period that we did it more like little bit by little bit, and we try to mm -hmm. disentangle like uh, the the little pieces. And somehow now we are now like thinking more. We try to have it more in a kind of structural plan with clear goals and, uh, and shared values that we all share uh, in in the team, and also in the belief that uh, somehow um, that the values that we put in front um, uh, as an organization, also on stage, and but also like reflect in the way we work. This is kind of uh, the work that we are. I mean, and also once again, this is not a good practice. We are at a very yeah. We guys always feel that we are at the beginning, but there's also so much work to be done in, in these institutions. So, so. I, find it, I find it really um, uh, heartening that we've all expressed feeling like there's a lot we don't know and that we're all at the beginning because I don't, I can't actually imagine it not feeling like that. And I think there's been very seldom times where I felt like that in my artistic practice, even, you know, where the levels of responsibility are not. 10 times your own body weight in the same mm. way, you know. Um, and I think that's actually really encouraging to hear that from us all, you know, I thought it was just me going, oh my God, what the hell's going on? But mm. I, I think it's also a um, uh, acknowledgement that we need to be in this much more kind of, you know, that kind of space, you know, like what's needed, what's happening. Um, and it's not this kind of long-term plan that we can just kind of mm. chronologically work through. It is so much of these very creative and artistic skills that are being applied in the moment, which are also very kind of human and social based relational skills, aren't they? You mm. know, like mirroring, listening, kind of counterpointing, balancing, leveling, um, you know, uh, calming or lifting, you know, and, and it does feel very, yeah, we're in, we're in a game and there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of, you know, teamwork to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, um, and so to, to connect to that, and also because it was one of your first, actually your opening question, like, uh, no, or not yeah. only like why did you come yeah. to this conversation, but mm. also like uh, what is at stake uh, for the field and for your organization, but also for the field on this topic. Mm. And I think to, to connect what you were saying for me, what is at stake is, I mean, I don't know the, the once again, the system in UK is so in detail, but I think you can say this more in general, is that uh, how we like how we as organizations and as a field are evaluated. I think this can be really seen differently, like um, it's so much, even in uh, if we talk about uh, uh, diverse recruiting, it's so much always focused on um, output and on results which i think is also very important but somehow we have to complexify a bit this way of evaluation and also think more about process and also acknowledge that this takes resources time investment mm -hmm. like race was saying like you can't uh, uh go in one hour to the to the community center and then come back and have a result and then we can check the boxes and then we're good for how we're evaluating no we really have to rethink a bit. I think this is this is for me one of the challenges and also one of the important ones is that uh, to to claim space uh, as an organization uh, to do this and to be able to um, to come also with a kind of vision how to do this and also have a more complexified way of evaluating because somehow. I have the feeling that uh, like this evaluating systems that are so much focused on output can also kind of destroy what you're actually trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, also connected to that is, is, is uh, like Ray's uh, story, which was also very, um, it was not completely connected, but I just wanted to come back to it because I find it so uh, touching when you were saying it is because also it's, it's something that I'm now seeing also with this, with our organization, as in we have uh, very competent, very beautiful, strong people from very different backgrounds coming in an organization and still, and from the outside and also from inside organization, a lot of times people are 
um, reduced to this kind of, for instance, positive action, and and somehow it's completely forgotten that 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 people have like are not uh, like of course of course it's part of our mission and part of our values that we now try to rethink the way how we recruit and uh, yeah. positive action is for a part is is part of it, but somehow that people feel themselves then reduced in the organization of uh, playing the person the the, the person who has a disability of playing the person who is of color uh, the playing the black person uh, or has to play this this role and is completely reduced uh, uh, his or her or their their identity to uh, to this this is a, a big challenge for us to um, to, 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 to tackle this and also to change this in, 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 in mind because somehow if if your whole um, I mean, and this is what's so strong that that, that uh, your testimony, or like your little uh, testimony on this, is like if the whole environment is projecting this on you, you have to be really strong to kind of uh, uh, not also uh, uh, kind of accept it yourself Self, and adopt yeah. it yourself. Yeah. yeah, to not take it on because yeah, I, I I really hear and feel that, and and it's Reese when you were talking about community, you know. Because you said that word a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a few. <laughs> you said it really necessarily, though. <laughs> um, it really made me feel, a, like, I think about, and I was just reminiscing with an old friend, actually, about how, what a lack of community I've always felt and how I didn't have any other Chinese. There's one other Chinese family, I think, where we grew up, and then... And then some Indian kids, and I think I remember one mixed race kid at school, and one I don't know, a very, yeah. very, very white um, kind of Tory town with a strong kind of nouveau riche and a strong kind of working yeah. class, but also very a lot of money in there, a lot of new money in there, and um, I just feel it actually not having a community really and now my parents go to the china or they used to before covid go to the chinese community center about 20 minutes drive away mm -hmm. and they started to get their community but as a second generation which is chinese you know um uh, i haven't found those people so it's interesting mm -hmm. these different degrees of uh, isolation or um of uh, like you know, um, my experience of racism or my cultural experiences or my feeling of in-betweenness, yeah. you know, literally between cultures and the, the lack of belonging, that kind of thing. Absolutely. It's a curious thing and, and it doesn't, I'm not saying, oh, but you've also got your community, so you're sorted, you know, at all, um, because that's also not what you're saying. You're talking about, you know, you know, senses of, exactly that sense of, belonging or not and actually advocate for something more thousand percent with more movement actually i think i have to agree with both of you and and, and so well put as well vs as well because um one of my thought process is this um you can't tackle ignorance from an ignorant perspective right and so actually the best thing we can all do is come from that place of we just don't know we should celebrate differences, yes. But the th one thing that we have in common is that we don't know. <laughs> we just don't have the answers. And actually, that is a, a stronger place of ignorance used in the positive way mm. to be able to create something that acknowledges all of these differences. The problem with ignorance used in the negative connotation is because people know or they think they know how it is. Want someone to know, right? Them. Exactly. No, it's I don't know about race. So, Reese or Annie, can you be the spokesperson for this? Can you hold air? Thousand percent. Not knowing that me being from St Kitts and Nevis mm. and walking into a Jamaican community centre will not go down well. But you don't know that, right? Because the Caribbean islands to you are the Caribbean islands, mm. but within the Caribbean islands. And me being from St. Kitts and Nevis, Jamaicans look down on Kittishans and we're known as the smallies, small island people. So I won't be able to hold any weight in that meeting 
unless it became a very big black v white thing, then I'm accepted. Yeah. But if it was just, if it's just an integrated thing, now I have to stake my claim. Mm -hmm. Why should we listen to this boy who's from the small island? Mm -hmm. And if you're not aware of that, you can accidentally on purpose put people in more compromising positions when they're meant to be going out doing the very thing that you've hired them to do mm -hmm. and I think what's amazing about not only how transparent you've both been but is it's we even in this meeting represent three maybe four five different cultures because my mine's is you know South South American as well we, we all of that but we formed a community based on a thing. Mm. So in a sense of belonging, you've got to remember all of this just stems back to identity, doesn't it? Absolutely. It really just stems back to identity. And are we forging an identity from the place we are at? Or are we trying to create it? So there's the individual identity and then there's a the collective identity. This now, this meeting with us three is a collective identity, but it's been stemmed out of the fact that we've all come here to say, these are the issues and we don't know how to tackle them. Is there a thing we can do together? And that's what I love. I, I love that. And Jez, I'm looking forward to the first opportunity to get out to Belgium and come Me and sit down, <laughs> come down and sit down and speak with you and Annie when we can touch base mm. properly, because these are the conversations that I'm invested in so that in five years time, I can turn around and say, this is my community. Mm. We, we forged a new land yeah. of and a principle we set here. They keep moving and they keep changing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it makes me think about, um, who was telling me about the human brain has a large part of it that is still nomadic because that's actually how humans lived, you know? Yeah. And I think that would then make sense in terms of reforming and re- yeah. generating community in each moment and and I do think a lot, a lot of artists are really good at that I think dance artists are really good at that you know you're throwing you're catching you're falling yeah. into each other you're sharing a space intensely with bodies yeah. you know um and creative ideas like almost immediately I've got friendships from doing a weekend workshop with you know other dancers there's an incredible capacity and um and desire to 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 meet you know yeah. and then i might not see these people for another 10 15 years and we meet each other and we go oh my god you know yeah. Yeah. well that resonance is really lovely but that mo nomadic sense that diaspora of um yeah. of, uh dancers of artists you know mm. artistic minds i think we need that flexibility i, I remember hearing a disabled uh stand-up comedian talking about stand up uh she also made a joke about that but um uh, about the about spaces like being so rigid and it takes me back to how things are designed you know um and actually how rigid spaces are so that desk you can't move that desk that yeah. fit that door you know but actually if we could keep adapting and shifting our spaces as we need them as well as our that would also serve our minds serve our relationships Absolutely. you know it would also yeah. serve the people we want to welcome in or work with and so it, it makes me think about that and and I, I was part of this um discussion around um racism you know in uh in uh, higher education and um and i felt very very uncomfortable about being in that i had kind of been out new parent you know just kind of been appointed in the role but hadn't been in the wasn't in the role yet and it was this thing about racism in higher education and, and i was really struck by this kind of desire for a list of actions you know what things we can do next you know like mm -hmm. um and I, I i'm not saying that's not that can't be helpful. But I think it's also acknowledging that this is the space where that those actions need to be happening already. Yeah. We can't, you know, not talking about it in the in the future or even the near future. Yeah. It's right now. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed is um in a lot of these conversations, it's always a lot of setting up for our kids and mm -hmm. setting up for the future. And I have a slightly different take on that, being a father as well. Um I can set a load of things up for my kids and they've never actually ever seen it exemplified if all I've done is spent my time setting it up for them. Mm -hmm. They still live now. They exist now. 
they need to see exemplified in our generation because the setup is part of the process. And we always talk, as you as you said, rightfully said earlier, that's like outputs, 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 outputs. Mm. We've got to think when we're setting things up for our children and the next generation, that's output based. That's still output based. We are not living the very thing we're talking about setting up, right? So when my children look back at me, I don't want them to be like, well, dad, you weren't around because you were working so hard setting something up that we may or may not use or it may or may not look like that in the future and I'm not saying that it's a bad principle to do but I am I'm also saying whilst we are setting something up we should be living the very thing that we're trying to set up Mm -hmm. so that they can it's being exemplified to oh the generation before us did this thing and they have left this thing in place as opposed to um it being sort of like an open letter sent to your children it's it's got to be more of a the letter explains what you've seen, not what we should have done, but didn't do, and now you guys should do it. Because if that's the case, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we're in, mm. i.e. people not knowing how, when, or why to pass the baton on mm. and relinquish or release people into the right fields. Because it's not about them not releasing people at all. It's been it's releasing people into the right fields. Do you ever felt like you've been pushed into a position that's like this doesn't really sit right with me because my skills are over here or mm. I'm 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 a lot better over here or so for instance um let's just say my job if, if my job didn't involve some aspect of communication or human to human contact I'd be redundant Mm. completely and utterly redundant so actually putting people in the right places having conversations like this and going well what's amazing is i now know i can go to someone and say well do you know what's happening in in belgium at the moment right i'll put you in touch with a guy called today i said do you see what i mean or do you know what's happening in the dance world at the moment right let me speak to annie and it's those that's the where the real power is and it was it was funny you were talking about you know the structures and the architecture of a room and something just came to me isn't it very interesting that we'll sit in a square room but make a circle? Mm. It, I find that fascinating. The human, the, 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 the human instinct is for connection. Mm. The room dictates how we should sit, right? Mm. If we're having a meeting, the room dictates how we should sit. And unless there is a dictator or a leader or someone at the top, we always put our chairs in the circle. And that's irrespective of the architecture. That to me is like a small microcosm of what we're trying to do based on an instinct that we already have. And you're right, there's a part of the brain that's nomadic. And the thing about being nomadic is that there was, there had to be respect for the place you were going. Mm -hmm. You had to respect the place you were going, but also represent the place you've just come from, which is why there was such a breadth of culture that's mixed in with the nomadic people. Mm -hmm. You can't say they are one way or they are completely left or completely right. Mm -hmm. They have a little bit of this because they've been there for a year. They've had a, and that melting pot, there's no excuse in this metropolitan world that we live in right now for us to not take advantage of that and have instead of the differences on post-it notes that look like this and go, right, those people need to deal with those people and those people need to deal with those people. Actually, who represents these communities, these, these, these cultures, who represents them? Is there a conversation that can be had holistically where we can take, and Dre, as you've said it again, best practice from these people, best practice from those people and share best practice from us so that there is a real holistic view that can tackle some of the micro stuff rather than always looking at the micro stuff and then having to tackle this holistic view and just flipping the model on its head, making us a better opportunity to deal with some of the internal issues and have more conversations like this that will be progressive. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's this thing about distribution, you know, not holding this centralised power or responsibility either, you know, it's not, and it's not to say that we can all relinquish responsibility, it's the opposite, it's like, can we all hold responsibility in each moment? Um, I'm just aware of time, but was there one more thing you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add to it, uh, also, once again, I'm always very faithful to the, to the subject, so I come back to this kind of challenge, uh, also connecting to what Reis was saying, what was so much resonating, 
to my thinking and also Annie, what you brought up, up actually about uh, diaspora communities. Uh, because for me, uh, I'm, I just became director and uh, my, most of my experience is now during a pandemic. So it's very much informed by, by this pandemic, which I find a very specific time. Uh, me, myself, I also have a diasporic background. I come from an Algerian family. And so somehow I, I also did some research this past, uh, like, uh, to my own, uh, like, uh, my, my Algerian family in Algeria, and also how kind of diasporic communities without uh, homogenizing diasporic communities, because I'm completely right, right, right that there's so many, that's, that's the complexity that everybody has its own particular history. But somehow there is something that's connected also with this, which for, for me was hopeful in these times of, of pandemic. It's that there is already, and this is completely not recognized by, uh, let's say, the West, that, there, that, that in the West, there are so many different communities living who have an experience to exchange culture and have a connection and have a kind of uh, social life from a distance. And this was something that uh, we were all forced to do this yeah. from a distance, uh, which is horrible. But there is also some, some knowledge that, that's, that's part of our society that's completely invisibilized. And somehow this was kind of a hopeful thing. At the same time, uh, talking about the challenge, uh, I have to say that I was so happy you raised with your uh, suggestion to come to Brussels. Please come to Brussels. Yeah. Because, because there is also this other reality, of course, that, that, that there is this knowledge about the sport communities of, and about having an exchange and having these networks over uh, different parts of the world and having this cultural exchange. At the same time, this pandemic, and it was, of course, already happening before the pandemic, not mentioning Brexit uh, or other kind of nationalistic and fascist uh, tendencies in Europe and outside of Europe, uh, that, that, there is, that there is this risk that, that this pandemic even uh, emphasized or enhanced this kind of um, tendencies. And, mm -hmm. and we are all, and I, I completely agree, the first responsibility we, we have is for our local communities and the links with our local communities. But at the same time, we also know the, the danger of what happens if you um, close yourself up and don't indeed reach out and don't reach out and get this uh, exchange about best practices and also don't get to meet each other anymore. Yeah. So this is kind of one of my fears, challenges that I see now for the future also for uh, Europe, or, but let's, let's, I mean, Europe itself is already a horrible border. So let's say that Europe itself is also a big responsibility uh, uh, in, in, for its outside borders and what's happening and the massacre, what's happening there. Uh, but uh, so, so this is one of these questions that I also have for, for us as an international festival, like for me then, uh, like um, it's difficult now also because we're still in this pandemic to understand what, if there will be ever a post pandemic, which mm. is also a question, uh, but also how can we foster again this, this exchange was so much needed. Uh, and how indeed, and which kind of knowledge that was invisibilized yeah. with, uh, with the diaspora communities can we use also to foster it more and to also um, go against this, um, this development in the world where borders become um, stronger and uh, more important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we should stop there. Uh, um, I have a suggestion because we have the next session penciled in um i was wondering if how, how people felt about the last hour or so it was maybe about 45 minutes and uh but maybe we could sit with that and maybe we could come back together on the wednesday anyway on the 10th 10 till 12 on the wednesday maybe if there's any questions that or, or ideas that kind of mm. felt that they were they came up that we'd like to move on a bit um, we could almost do a continuing on from um, and maybe we could just do the standard thing of introducing ourselves again.